those who don't know, I'm Eric Musgrove, county historian and lots of other stuff, but we're in the midst of a three-year monthly presentation series on Suwannee County's history. Uh, today we are talking about what is usually called the Civil War. And I've got a note here, parental, dis to, uh, parental discretion is advised. A couple pictures that you know little kitties don't always need to see, but it is part of our history and so I do present it, but I uh, just wanted to put that out there in case there are young kids in the audience. As we get into the Civil War, a pet peeve of mine that I'm going to go ahead and mention. Definition of a civil war. A war between groups of people in the same country. Um, normally, that's for two people, two groups or more people who are trying to, to take over one country, like the English Civil War or, or Spanish Civil War. This war that we call the American Civil War really was not that. It was a, a group of people who broke off, broke away, seceded from the United States as technically was allowed by law at that time, or was not illegal at that time, I should say, and formed their own country. But because uh, history is written in the eyes of the victor, the Union won, the Union thought it was a civil war, we normally call it civil war. During that war, though it's normally called something like the War of Southern Independence, uh, war of Rebellion or Civil War by the North, lots of other lists. Um, let's see. War Between the States, the War of the Rebellion, the War of Separation, the War for Southern Independence, War for the Union, Second American Revolution, even Third American Revolution sometimes, or the War of Northern Aggression, War of Southern Aggression. It just depends on, on who we're looking at. Even Mr. Lincoln's War, Mr. Davis's War, just all kinds of different names for that war. But most history books up until the 60s called it the war between the states or some kind of variation on that. So if you look at older history books, that's what you'll see. In the last 60 years, you see it more as civil war. Uh, but again, it doesn't meet the criteria technically for a civil war. So two independent nations fought against one another. One was conquered by the other or, or defeated by the other. And thus we have the United States of America as we have it today. Uh, you may remember in your uh, history lessons, that before the Civil War ended, for the first 75 years of American history of the United States, it was these United States. It was individual states, plural, a plurality of states, these United States. After the Civil War, it became the United States, one country. So the Civil War helped to do that, for better or for worse, uh, kind of led to that. Now that I'm not going to get into all the details as to why the Civil War happened, that's for another time, another place, another group. Uh, but there are lots of different reasons. Let's just leave it at that without getting into too much detail. I want to talk about Florida and Suwannee County's participation in that war that, again, most people call the Civil War. Florida seceded on January 10, 1861. We were the third state to secede from the Union after uh, South Carolina and then Mississippi and then Florida. Florida was the newest state in the Union, in the South anyway, um, 1845. We talked about that last month when Florida became a state. So we were the youngest state in the Confederacy. We were the least populated state in the Confederacy, uh, but we did secede third out of all the states to secede. Um, it's hard to see, but I've drawn a little red line, and there is a writing or, or marking down to James A. Newman. He was Swanee County's representative to that uh, secession. Uh, the ordinance of secession, and it was signed by a lot of different folks there. It's probably hard for you to read most of their names. A lot of them are, were prominent folks, prominent politicians. Some of them became more prominent afterwards. Um, some didn't, but James Newman lived here in Suwannee County. He was a county commissioner for Suwannee County during the term of the Civil War until the end of the war basically stripped all the, the politicians from power. Basically, if you were in the Confederacy and you were a politician, and you're out of office. You cannot be in office anymore. So he was removed uh, because of the end of the Civil War. So January is when Florida seceded. Uh, the next month, the Confederate States of America was provisionally organized in Montgomery, Alabama. I worked across the street from the uh, first Confederate White House at the State Archives when I was in college uh, there in Alabama, uh, right there beside the, the state capitol where the secession happened. Um, so, seceded, and it became the Confederate States of America. 
This document is one of the documents I actually brought with me today. You can look at after the presentation. And we are blessed in Swanee County that we have not had a major disaster to destroy our records. Yes, knock on lots of wood. Columbia County, I believe I mentioned last month or the previous month, Columbia County's courthouse has burned four times that I know of. Uh, sometimes intentional, sometimes accidental. Uh, one of the times I think I told you all was because somebody had a court case and so they decided to burn up the evidence and burn up the whole courthouse. So Suwannee County, although we are a newer county than Columbia, which is where we, we came from, we broke off of, our records go back 20 or 30 years prior to what Columbia County's got at this point. So we are blessed with documents preceding the Civil War and during the Civil War. This is one of those instances of that time period. And, and what it is basically is uh, Angus Magali, who was the first clerk of the court. He had lived in the what we would call the Welburn area today, but he'd been there for a few decades. But he became the first clerk of the court when Swanee County was organized in 1858. And he is writing a, a final judgment. There's really nothing interesting about the judgment itself. It's against uh, a William Rawls from John O'Neill, the amount is $202.50, which was a good amount back then. But what's so noteworthy and interesting about it is normally from the documents that we have of him, he would sign it, you know, if it's 1861, it's the so-and-so day and so-and-so year of American independence. Well, he had written that here and then scratched it out and put, uh, and the independence of the Confederate States of America the first year. So I picture him in Houston, which was the county seat at the time, writing these documents. Somebody rushes in and says, hey, uh, the, the new uh, constitution of the Confederate States has been adopted, which was the previous month. Hey, we're a new country now. And so he said, scratch this American stuff and, and let me put this new state. Now, that's probably not what happened, but I like to picture it that way. <laughs> just one of those fascinating tidbits. What he probably did, he just was used to writing the American independence thing and was busy and preoccupied and just writing. It's like, oh no, let me scratch it out. So that's probably what happened, but I like my story better. As the war progresses, we've got several things going on again as it relates to Swanee County. Captain James Tucker is a steamboat operator on the Suwannee River. Uh, he has a steamboat named the Madison, which is one of the places he lived. Uh, he had been on the Suwannee River for several years. Basically, he used it as a floating general store. You couldn't go out to Walmart or Lowe's or something like that uh, in the 1850s, 1860s. There weren't really much in the way of railroads until early 1861, right before the war started. So railroads weren't really an issue. Roads were few and far between. So the easiest way to transport goods usually was the Suwannee River. And so he would take his steamboat up the Suwannee River and uh, depending on what year it was and what season it was, but he would sell things and trade things. You couldn't go down to the bank because there weren't really banks in the area. So you would barter. I've got deer skins. Let me trade it for that iron pot that I can't make here in Swanee County. So he did this for several years. Uh, the Madison the steamboat that he was running uh, was built between 1854 and 1855 up in Indiana, uh, apparently, New Albany. And again, he named it for Madison, which is where he was living at the time. Steamboat, according to the records we have, was 120 feet long, 22 feet wide, 4 feet deep, and displaced 99 tons. So not a huge ocean-going vessel, but that wouldn't fit on the Suwannee River. He wanted something for the Suwannee River. So he would run it. He also was given authorization by the federal government before the war to operate as mail delivery. So twice a week, uh, or twice a month, excuse me, he would go between Columbus, which was a bustling town where the Swanee River State Park is today, and down to Hernando County. They would go back and forth twice a month delivering mail, which was you know, not too bad for the day. So that's what he would do. Um, before the war, one of the things that happened with him, one of the interesting tidbits, was the federal government would not declare the Swanee River navigable beyond a certain point. Um, I believe it was Columbus. Yeah, only up to Columbus. He wanted to get to White Springs. He wanted to be able to travel even further. So he basically decided, I'm going to show them that it can be done. So he got in a steamboat. He started steaming upriver further than any other steamboat had gone before. Fortunately for him, there was a lot of rain at the same time. So the river was at a flood stage. And so he was able to make it all the way to White Springs. Now, he was able to make it, and most of his boat was able to make it. The, uh, that, too far ahead. Uh, the, the river, because it rose so much, what happens when the river rises? What do you see around the river at that point? Trees. It's in the way. Trees. 
that were up there, now they're right here. And so he lost his funnels and the, the pilot house. So most of his boat got into White Springs, not necessarily all of it. But he proved a point. And by the time he repaired his boat to go back and service, the federal government said, all right, it's navigable technically all the way up to White Springs. So for better or for worse, he did that. So once the war began, the Civil War began, he basically put a steamboat in operation as a warship. The Confederate States of America did not have a lot in the way of, of warships, did not have a lot in the way of military might. Most of the production capabilities, industrial capabilities, were up in the north. And so the South was looking wherever they could for weapons, for, for things to use for the war. And so Captain Tucker put a steamboat into service as basically a gunboat. We call it probably a gunboat today. Put, put some soldiers on it, maybe a, a cannon if you're lucky. And that's what he did for several months. He'd also operated to supply settlers uh, that were upriver as the, and we'll talk about it more in a little bit, the Anaconda Plan that the North put into play, that this way to strangle the southern uh, states by cutting off their port access to goods. Um, he was able to help customers that way too. But what he did was would use this steamboat and again, outgunned, outnumbered, uh, the United States Navy had dozens and then eventually hundreds of warships, large ships, and all he has is just little steamboat. So he could not fight, this is not a you know, battle, one-on-one -on -one battle. He would go out and he would basically make uh, privateering raids, we'd call it. Uh, he would go out and, and raid merchant ships that were under control of the United States government. Uh, for instance, there's one mission written about in uh, July 4th, 1861, so just a couple months after the war began, and as the United States is celebrating its independence, uh, he steamed out and recaptured three schooners that had railroad irons at the mouth of the Suwannee River. Uh, railroad irons, railroad ties were not something that we could build in Suwannee County and the surrounding areas at all. It was something shipped from up north, maybe Virginia or whatnot, but the Union and its blockade had captured these three schooners, these these three uh, seagoing vessels that had iron on them, and he went out and his boat recaptured them. So they could then be brought up the Suwannee River and could be used to transport those goods uh, to where they were needed in the Confederacy. So he was able to do that. Uh, his troops, whether it was him or people under him, would continue to operate the steamboat, kind of like as a defense. You couldn't come up the Suwannee River if you were a Union gunboat because you've got this, this small steamboat kind of protecting the water. Well, eventually, in 1863, July, I believe, sometime anyway, in 1863, he is ordered with his men to go northward to Virginia, to the Army of, Virginia, of Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee. He is ordered to go up there, so he's got to leave his steamboat. So what he does is uh, he knows that there's not going to be a crew. He orders the steamboat scuttled. And what happens is uh, there are a couple of guys who remain behind because there are many settlers by 1863 because of the blockade this whole area is being strangled for goods, uh, necessities, things like that, uh, medicines, whatnot. Even food is hard to come by sometimes. So uh, what some settlers in the Lafayette County region say is, hey, can you please send one more load of food up on your steamboat before you scuttle it? And so Captain Tucker says, yes, and at that point I need the ship scuttled. And so a couple of guys steam the boat upriver one last time to Troy, which at the time was the, capital, uh, the, the county seat, of Lafayette County, they deliver that corn, and then they take the boat into Troy Springs and scuttle it. So that final run is done, and there was one of the one of the guys that did it. He wrote probably 50 years ago, talking about it. I have to go back and look for my records to find where it was, but but he wrote about the incident about 50 years later, talking about having scuttled the Madison in Troy Springs. His, his goal, what we can tell, is. He wanted to come back after the war, raise it, put it back into service, which is why he didn't burn it. He just had them open up some holes, and, and then there are, there are holes naturally in, in boats to allow water out and stuff. Just open them up, and, and there you go. It's not something you normally do unless you want to sink it. So the boat was scuttled, still more or less intact. It was just under a little bit of water, and he and his men went off to, to fight in Northern Virginia, Virginia. Well, there were two years left in the war. This is 1863. The Civil War ends in 1865. So with the two years that are ensuing, there's a perfectly good and usable steamboat sitting in Troy Springs, close to the county seat of Lafayette County, and close to other areas within Swanee <coughs> County uh, that have residences and people that are there. Well, if you want to build a house, 
Are you going to go out and cut trees and shape them and form them? Or are you going to look over at that steamboat that's already got nice cut wood and just steal some wood off of that? Or say you need to get some salt. We talked about it, I believe, last month. How you couldn't go down to the store and buy salt. You'd have to go down to, to the ocean, or to the Gulf in our case, and boil water. If you've got to boil it in something metal, well, why should I scrounge around and try to find some metal when there's, there's funnels, there's boilers in that steamboat made out of metal and iron? I can just take them, cut them in half, and take them down uh, to the ocean or to the Gulf to boil the water. So that's what happened. As those two years progressed, people just kept taking bits and pieces of the steamboat. So by the end of the war, there's nothing left above the water. There's nothing left above the hull. It's just an empty hull. And so Captain Tucker never comes back to reclaim it. So that's a picture uh, done in the late 1800s, maybe early, early 1900s, to show what was left of the Steamboat Madison at that point. You can still see the ribs and a lot of planking. Uh, the top deck is gone now at this point. The main deck's gone. But you still see most of the hull was still there. Hmm. There's another picture of it taken, I'm not sure when. Now that's a picture I took in 2007 when I went there uh, with my family. We went uh, snorkeling. The river was low. There was only one foot of water. I was basically snorkeling and crawling across the ribs just doing this, just, just pulling myself across. So that's basically what it looks like today. It is still there. Now there are some experts that claim this is a different boat because it's not as long as the Madison was. But if you go out there, you will see that the stern would have been in the river, Swanee River. I mean, this is Troy Springs up here, but it would have been probably sticking out a little bit. And over time, 150 years, currents, debris, have knocked, basically knocked the stern off, more or less. So most scholars think this is the Madison. I'm going to agree with what the guy that did it, that sank it, said, yes, yeah, I, I scuttled it there. I'm going to go with the firsthand survivor's account. I mentioned already the Anaconda plan. A little bit more detail. See, this is a picture drawn of the, uh, the, in the war. Anaconda crushing its victims, and that's kind of what the North was looking at to do to the South. Let's cut off all their ports. Let's cut off all their access because, again, the Confederacy did not have the means to, to produce everything it needed for war, whether it was medicine, guns, ammunition, ships, whatever it might be. The Confederacy just did not have the means to do that. The North did, but not the South. So the South had to go to other places, such as England, France, wherever they could go to get stuff. And as they strangled these major ports, gradually it became harder and harder to get in to deliver those supplies. What happens was you would deliver the, the goods, you would pick up maybe cotton, which was a big thing, cotton, or deer pellets or whatever it might be that was needed overseas wherever you came from. Um, not necessarily usually money, but those kinds of things. And so as this war progressed and this Anaconda plan came to fruition, the South started using what's called blockade runners. Just it's a, a ship. To begin with, it was just, hey, there's a ship I know that's fast. Let's take that, put it into service, and we're going to take out what we can and bring in what we can. And, and so basically they were hoping to outrun the Union ships that were stationed outside of these ports. As the Anaconda plan continued, the ports were being captured one by one. I think the last port uh, the Confederacy had was like Charlotte or something, um, somewhere in, in south of North Carolina, and it was shut down, I believe, in January of 1865. So that was the only port. Um, by the middle of the war, places like uh, New, New Orleans had been captured, 1863, 1864. Mobile Bay up in Virginia had been captured long before that. So all these major ports were now captured, even in Florida, Key West. Jacksonville, Tampa, Pensacola, all those were captured within the first couple years of the war by the North. So we could not use those major ports. So what these blockade runners did was they had to get creative. For every ship that would go out, I think three or four would be captured and be able to come back. Three or four would be captured. So gradually from buying merchants, people would order purpose-built ships just for speed. Now you can carry some stuff and it's fast, let's build it in England especially. Had a lot of them built, even France. Uh, you would build them wherever you could. You'd buy them and order them with certain specifications, speed being the main thing. And since these ports were no longer in use, they would start using whatever rivers they could, whatever inlets they could. And one of the popular places in Florida 
was the mouth of the Suwannee River. They would basically go upriver, and then they would go to where the Santa Fe flows into the Suwannee River, which was about as far north as these ships could go, because they were, they were sea-going, ocean-going, across the Atlantic Ocean. They were not as small as these steamboats I've been talking about. But they could come upriver to Branford area and where the Santa Fe comes in, <coughs> that, in that region. They would then unload their supplies, so the supplies could be transported to Lake City and places like that, and vice versa. And that's how a lot of goods came in. They'd take it by wagon, take it by horse from that drop-off area and take it to Lake City, which would then take it to the railroad. It could be dispersed in Florida, at least. So that's kind of what happened. And the Suwannee River and the Santa Fe River were major locations in Florida for that. All right, looking at some of the folks from Suwannee County that were involved in the Civil War, one of them was a gentleman by the name of David Lang. Born in 1838, he died in 1917. He was a surveyor by trade. Before the war, he was a surveyor in this area. Lived here in Suwannee County. When the war began, he joined the Confederate Army. He actually attended a, a military institute as part of his education, so, so he already knew military stuff. But he became a county surveyor, I think I talked about last month. County surveyor was an important part of Suwannee County early on because there was a lot of land that nobody ever lived on. And so the state and federal governments needed to figure out and survey what was here and then divide it so others could buy it up. So David Lane was one of the county surveyors, which was a, a position in county government at the time. And so he did that for a few years until the war began. He enlisted in the Confederate Army. He enlisted in a company that was made up of people from Suwannee County and surrounding areas and served there for some time. Uh, within a month, he was promoted sergeant. Um, he was discharged because sometimes it was three or four months you would serve, and then eventually it was you're going to serve for a year, and then by 1862, it was basically you enlist and you, you serve for the duration of the war until it's over. That's how they used to do things back then. And so he did that. He was uh, re-enrolled. He was a captain at that point, so he has risen in the ranks from private all the way up to captain, and he doesn't stop there. He is... He is uh, fighting in the Battle of Antietam. He's fighting at Fredericksburg. He's wounded in both those places. Um, let's see. Yeah. At Fredericksburg, he's standing by a house with a chimney. Federal uh, artillery hits the chimney, knocks down a chunk, hits him in the head. Gravely injured. They're not even sure he's going to make it, but he survives. Continues on. He is promoted to colonel in the 8th Florida. I had to make sure. 8th Florida. In 1863, fights in the Battle of Chancellorsville. Chancellorsville is where Stonewall Jackson was killed by his own men accidentally, or shot, and mortally injured by his own men accidentally. Um, at the end of that battle, as that battle was raging, the brigade commander, who was uh, General Perry, later becomes governor, I believe, of Florida, he is stricken with typhoid fever, and so Lane is put in charge of that brigade. A couple months later, we have this battle you all might have heard of called Gettysburg. He is in charge of the 8th Florida at Gettysburg. So they are fighting on Cemetery Ridge. Uh, they are in part of Pickett's Charge. I think everybody's heard of Pickett's Charge. Uh, he leads that as, as part of the Florida unit. Uh, by the end of that battle, uh, let's see, 60% of the soldiers are dead or wounded from the Florida uh, Brigade. 700 soldiers, 60% of them are either dead or injured at the end of that three-day battle at Gettysburg. Well, he continues on. General Perry comes back. He gets off his typhoid fever. He comes back, but periodically he's out for other medical ex uh, reasons, and eventually he just has to resign his commission to ill health. So David Lang is in charge for several times. Uh, the mine run campaigns, Bristow campaigns. Uh, he's leading the brigade in the Battle of Cold Harbor. One interesting thing about Cold Harbor is that's the battle where Union forces, the Federal forces, lost 7,000 men in seven minutes. They were charging uh, prepared entrenchments of the Confederate Army. They lose 7,000 men in, in, in seven minutes. It was so bad that they were pinning their name on their, their, their uh, uniforms before they charged because they knew they weren't going to make it. But he was in charge of the Florida unit that was there. Uh, lots of other things. He eventually surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse with General uh, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia <coughs> in April of 1865. So he does that, but then he's got a career after that too. So he uh, becomes a civil engineer. He went from surveyor to civil engineer. He moves over to Tallahassee. He is elected a state representative, which he serves for about uh, eight years. He serves as the adjutant general of Florida. 
So basically he's in charge of reorganizing the state militia, which becomes the National Guard, which we still have today. He's in charge of that for many years. He also uh, helped to increase funding and pay rates for the troops. So he, he was a guy in favor of the troops, in favor of the veterans and then just troops that were serving the country. In 1895, he went back to Gettysburg because he was a young man when this war happened and he was one of the few brigade commanders still alive and so he was basically pointing out this is where Florida's troops were during this battle. So if you go up to Gettysburg, I've never been there, but if you go up there, there are monuments set as to where different units were stationed. He was the one that told them where to put Florida's uh, brigade. So he did that. Uh, he came back to Florida. He resumed his political career. He basically served in the legislature until 1901. And then he was the personal secretary for two or three governors. So very involved in politics here in Florida. Um, he's buried in Tallahassee. The Sons of Confederate Veterans in Tallahassee named their camp after him. So he did a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff going on. Meanwhile, as the war's going on, people still have to survive back home. Uh, people that are either too old or have other duties that are not fighting in the war are continuing about their daily lives as best as possible. One of them is a guy by the name of Thomas Dexter, who I think I've talked about before. Again, other things going on during the Civil War. Besides fighting, there was killing, there was death, and one of those that died was Thomas Dexter. Thomas Dexter we've talked about before. Uh, he was the largest slave owner in Suwannee County in 1860 when our first census was taken. He lived, uh, his plantation basically was where the IFAS uh, station is on County Road 136. The lake there is actually called Dexter Lake, so that's why. But he was born in Rhode Island, died in 1862. He did a lot of service for the county before we were in Suwannee County. Served in the Second Seminole War. He was postmaster of Lower Mineral Springs, which is now Suwannee uh, Springs. Things like that, lots of different stuff. But he died in a gin house fire. And as one of his slaves wrote about years later, his name was Claude Augustus Wilson. He was born a slave in 1857 at the plantation there of Tom Dexter. Uh, let's see. Mr. Wilson thought that his master was a kindly man and he thought perhaps because he was a Yankee had something to do with it. On the other hand, his wife was a Southerner, Marianne Dexter, and uh, she was just the opposite. Now the Dexter plantation, Mr. Wilson remembers as being a very large operation where the slaves worked under a driver from dawn till dusk, and he remembered working in the fields as a boy while his mother and sister worked in the Dexter uh, mansion. And actually he mentioned that his mother was rebellious and harassed the quote, Mrs until she was allowed to work in the field so she could be near her man, as, as he called it anyway. He also remembered that Mr. Dexter died from a gin house fire. And, and what was written decades later, he says, quote, his master did not go to war, but remained on the plantation. One day at noon during the war, the gin house was seen to be a fire. One of the slaves rushed in and found the master badly burned and writhing in pain. He was taken from the building and given first aid, but his body being burned in oil and so badly burned it burst open thus ended the life of the kindly master of Claude's. That's a really bad way to go. Now, when the war ended in 1865, uh, his wife, of course, was in charge of the plantation, and they were very apprehensive because of hating her and how she had treated them. So when peace came, she offered the slaves to stay on as sharecroppers, and they could keep half of what they raised, but none of them stayed. They all left. They did not like her. So uh, as we go through Swanee County history and looking at various records that we have, we are fortunate here in Swanee County that we have not had a major disaster of a fire or flood or whatnot that has destroyed our records. So we have early history here in Swanee County, even predating Columbia County's history. Uh, this here is, is a, a picture of one of the documents that I've got from the time of the Civil War, and I found it while I was going through old documents. It had been stored for decades and decades off-site somewhere, just been shoved into a room. And I was going through it, and I saw it, and I recognized the name of the plaintiff, which was Dexter, and so I got curious about it. So I opened it up and read through it, and it's a final judgment of a foreclosure, which is not really odd, uh, but when I looked at it, uh, what it contained was actually very interesting. It's a foreclosure from 1863. It's against the estate of Andrew J. Smiley, who was probably the son of Lieutenant James Smiley that we talked about a month or two ago that was killed in the Second Seminole War uh, when uh, the Indians attacked his father-in-law's place across the street basically from where I live. Uh, so in 1854, this Smiley here, Andrew J. Smiley, was given the right to control his own assets even though he was under 21, which at the time was the 
the age not only for voting, but to be able to own property legally and things like that. But he was given control of his own property, but by 1863 he was dead, probably from the Civil War. And so as you're reading through this, the thing that actually uh, is very interesting about it is it's foreclosure of property of a mortgage, but it's not land, it's actually a person. So when we read through this, you read, the defendant, uh, he and his hereby barred and foreclosed from his equity of redemption in the Negro boy George, mentioned and described in the indenture of mortgage, and that the said Negro boy George be sold at public auction to the highest bidder, buying under the direction of the sheriff of Suwannee County. So sadly, this is the sale of a slave named George. It's unfortunate uh, to own another human being was and is a terrible thing, but but it, it's again, it's part of our history. We've got to learn from it, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And I've said it before, and I'm saying it again. It's part of history. So if you don't know the past, you're doomed to repeat its mistakes. Now then, moving back to the war, to the Civil War, at the northwestern boundary of Suwannee County, in the community of Columbus, was a railroad bridge. There's still one there today, but there was a railroad bridge at that point that had been completed just before the Civil War began, and it was owned at the time by the Pensacola and Georgia Railroad. And this railroad served as the primary supply line for Confederate forces in and outside of Georgia, uh, Florida going into Georgia and other places. It was the main railroad that was in use in Florida. Uh, this railroad became even more important after 1863, after the fall of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River, cut the Confederacy in half. Basically, you couldn't get uh, supplies from the west of the Mississippi over to the east of the Mississippi, so it became very important. So in 1864, Union troops landed in Jacksonville for, I believe, the fourth time, and they were under General Truman Seymour, and he was ordered to march from Jacksonville, and one of his missions was to take the bridge over Swanee River there at Columbus in Swanee County, and the thought there was hopefully to cut off the transfer of food, the transfer of men from Florida to other places where it was badly needed. So the Union forces landed at the start of the campaign, they had a whole lot more men in Florida because Florida was kind of a, a backwoods area. There had not been major battles in Florida. You know, a couple of spots like on the coast, coastal communities, those kinds of things, Pensacola, Key West and whatnot. But basically Florida was a backwards, backwoods part of the war, so we don't have a lot of troops here. So when General Seymour and his thousands of troops landed, we just did not have enough to defend. But those numbers increased as other states like Georgia and Alabama sent some of their forces into North Florida. So Brigadier General Joseph Finnegan, who was commanding the Confederate forces, he was, he was able to get a lot of men up, but he was also concerned that Union forces were going to outflank him and then attack that railroad bridge, which would then cut off supplies from Florida into Georgia. So uh, he did like a last ditch measure of let's put 30 men there at the bridge, 15 on either side of it. So if worst comes, you push on the shovel and the worst happens, we can burn the bridge and so the Union forces can't cross over and get even further. Say perhaps into uh, Tallahassee to capture the capital or something like that. So he stationed 30 men there as a last ditch effort. But meanwhile, his forces were uh, coming together at Lake City and he planned to have a battle at Lake City and prepared for that. But eventually the battle actually happened a little ways east of there at a Westy, east of Lake City on February 20th, 1864. Um, it's one of those things where we call it, the, the Southerners call it Olusty, the North calls it Ocean Pond because the North named their battles after the closest body of water. The Southerners named it after the closest community. So it's, we won the battle, it's called Olusty. But anyway, the forces were about the same amount of people, several thousand. It was not a big battle as you compare it to say Gettysburg or Antietam or one of those battles up North. But it was a big, big battle. It was Florida's biggest Civil War battle. And not only that, but federal casualties were about 40%, which makes it, I believe, the third highest casualty rate of any major battle in the Civil War. So that bridge over the Swanee River was saved. It kept supplying Confederate troops and Confederate uh, food all the way to the end of the war. Uh, the Confederate earthworks that were built near the bridge as a final defensive position are still there and part of what's now Swanee River State Park. This is a map of 1864 showing Swanee County. This is drawn by Union soldiers who may or may not have been in Suwannee County in a while, but it does point out several major things. In red, you can see that railroad, Pensacola and Georgia Railroad, coming through. You can see the major communities, places like White Springs, which is in Hamilton, 
Uh, you've got Columbus, again, a major community. Uh, you've got Mineral Spring, which is Swanee Springs. Houston, the county seat. Little River PO, which was established by George McClellan uh, 25, 30 years before this. Very close to where Walburn is today. Uh, you've got New Boston down here, which was a community. Charles Ferry is still listed. Uh, places like that. Live Oak is not even large enough to be on the list. Spring Grove is close to where it is. Um, Live Oak had been established by 1861. We talked about that last month. First records I show, uh, have found show it being named Live Oak Station in 1861 on this railroad. So Live Oak's not even there yet on this Union map. But it gives you a good idea of the roads leading through. That's the old Stagecoach Road right there. Um, yeah, road up to Jasper, whatnot. The old uh, Spanish Road, so a lot of it's still there on one way or the other, some other name. Let's see. Other documents I've got with me. Just interesting tidbits uh, of personal interest to folks. Uh, one of our soldiers named uh, John Platt. I don't know why we had it. I think it might have been part of a court case. I don't know why we have it, but we got it. And basically it is a listing where he was in a hospital up in Virginia, presumably injured in combat. He basically is given a furlough to come down home to Columbus where he lived and his family lived. And so this is his furlough papers. Uh, there is his quartermaster's department being able to transport from Lake City to Madison, which he would then get off and come over here, uh, come to Columbus, which is where he lived. It's got information like his age, his eye color, hair color, all kinds of different stuff. Very interesting. But it's just one of those little tidbits of, of Swanee County history that's going on. Uh, incidentally, he is the second person that got a marriage license in Swanee County. So he was already married and was second guy to get a marriage license when Swanee became a county. So that's why I know a little bit about him. Other things going on, probably our most infamous incident involving the Civil War, which a lot of people still don't seem to know about, even locally, is a guy by the name of Lewis Thornton Powell. Sometimes he's called Payne. Lewis Thornton Powell was a young man. His father, George C. Powell, was a Baptist minister. They lived in Hamilton County for many years, but as a minister, his father traveled, and so by 1859, they moved to Swanee County. They moved to a place about a mile outside of what he would call the Live Oaks, which is Live Oak today. I lived about a mile outside of it, uh, where his dad preached in different communities. Um, at the age of 17, the Civil War begins, and he joins up, although he's too young. He was not the only too young person to join up. But he joins the Hamilton Blues, or the Jasper Blues. <coughs> two different names in the same unit, which is made up of a lot of people from here. It was just, depending on where you lived, and again, traveling was not easy to come by, you would just go to the closest one, and the closest one to him was up in Jasper. And he knew a lot of the folks that were part of that, that unit. Um, Hamilton Blues, it later became part of the 2nd Florida Infantry Company I, what it was later called. He had two brothers, George and Oliver, that joined later. One of them would die in the war, one of them would be injured, but survive. But he fought in several battles, uh, let's see, um, Peninsula Campaign, he was captured at Gettysburg. Again, probably during Pickett's charge. He was one of those that survived, but then was captured. So he was one of those 60% uh, casualty lists. He was captured while wounded. And uh, as he's being nursed back to health, a nurse takes, a female nurse, takes fancy to him and apparently helps him to escape as he, after he's well enough to, to get around. So he escapes. He wanders around. He can't find his own unit. So he joins a group that's Commonly known as Mosby's Rangers. It was actually, let's see, 43rd Battalion Company B, but Mosby's Rangers is what they're usually known as. They were a uh, kind of a guerrilla unit. They didn't operate like the normal army, let's stand in line and face each other and shoot each other. They were more of guerrilla units. So let's go in and attack, and then go in and attack over here and, and leave. So, guerrilla warfare. So, he was a part of that for a couple of years. Um, he was found to be, according to the folks that knew him, he was an eager youngster always keyed up for battle, chivalrous and generous and a gallant gentleman. That's from the people that served with him. That's what they said about him. Um, he also, I forgot to mention before the war, he was well liked by his peers. Uh, his nickname was Doc because he was very good at tending to animals. Unfortunately, one animal kicked him in the jaw 
which is why his jaw looks like that. Mm -hmm. He got kicked by a mule, I believe. But he basically was kind of a veterinarian type, you know, a person that liked to take care of animals on the farms. But anyway, as the war progresses, 1864, 1865, uh, he leaves Mosby's Rangers. He perhaps could have joined the Confederate Secret Service. That's one of those things that some folks say yes, some folks no, but a lot of those records are gone, so we don't know for sure. But there, there are indications that he may have joined the Confederate Secret Service, or that might have just been a Union ploy uh, to cast blame on some folks for something later on. Um, he is actually arrested in January of 1865. He's in Baltimore, which is enemy territory, but it's one of those border states. Um, but he's arrested for causing a ruckus with a maid. Um, he's released when the witness fails to appear. He gives his name there as Lewis Payne, P-A-I-N-E. What happened was he had stayed at a, a family by the name of P-Y-N-E, Payne, and he stayed at their house, so he just used their name instead of his own. But he was released, went out and about. Well, while in Baltimore, he meets the equivalent of a famous movie star today, a, a person in the theater um, named John Wilkes Booth. You may have heard of him. John Wilkes Booth. And basically, John Wilkes Booth helps him out. He needs some money or food or whatever. So John Wilkes Booth helps him out. He says, hey, by the way, I'm... I'm looking to kidnap President Lincoln so we can kidnap him and get him exchanged and released for a lot of, of Confederate prisoners that are being, hold, uh, being held in, in bad, bad prisons and stuff up north, Elmira and whatnot, that they're not being taken care of. So I want to trade those thousands of soldiers for President Lincoln, which that's not President Lincoln, but uh, President Lincoln. So you know, that sounds like a good idea. So Lewis Lauren Powell, who's in favor of the South, says, all right, I'm, I'm in. I'm in on this. Well, meanwhile, the war comes to a close. April of 1865, General Lee surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse to General Grant. That is not the end of the war, but basically that's the writing on the war. That uh, writing on the wall. That was the largest army left of the Confederacy. That's done. Everybody knows the war's over. It's going to be over in a few months, few weeks. And so, what happens is this plan to kidnap President Lincoln now shifts to, hey, let's kill him. But not only him. Let's try to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson, who was from Tennessee, but turned against his fellow Tennesseans who served in the Confederacy to become Vice President. And maybe if we're lucky, let's kill uh, William Seward right here, who's Secretary of State, who's been kind of in charge of a lot of this war. And maybe even General Grant, some suggestions are that they wanted to kill General Grant because he'd done a lot of damage to the South. So that's the plan. Several other people are involved. Lewis Thornton Powell, who by this point is 21 years old, is tasked with killing William Seward, the Secretary of State. And so in April of 1865, April 14th, while John Wilkes Booth goes to Ford's Theater to attend Our American Cousin being performed with the President uh, there and shoots him, Lewis Thornton Powell is knocking on the door where, Lu where uh, William Seward is recuperating from a carriage accident. Lewis claims, hey, I'm a doctor's messenger boy or errand boy, I've got some medicine for him. They don't want to let him in, so he fights his way in, uh, pulls out a gun, pulls out a knife, the gun misfires, he starts hitting people over the head with it anyway, he pulls out his knife, starts slicing and dicing, uh, wounds like s several people, seven I think, um, let's see if I've got it in here, five people, five people he wounds with the butt of the gun or his knife. William Seward is in the bed recuperating from the carriage accident. He has heavily bandaged around his neck. So when Lewis Lauren Powell goes to stab him in the neck, it's deflected and hits him in his jaw, cheekbone area. And as more people pour in to try to help the Secretary of State, uh, Lewis Thornton Powell runs out saying, I'm mad, I'm mad, and goes and hides overnight at, uh, in a cemetery. William Seward survived. And the interesting thing, when you go to look for pictures or draw, uh, either photographs or pictures of him, you will find that most of the time, after the, especially after this incident, you see everything from his left side. You don't see the right side, and this is why, because of the injury suffered. That's like the only one I could find that really shows it well. This drawing shows a little bit of it, but they've cleaned it up. So 
go look Google if you see pictures of him. When he's younger, you see both sides equally, but after the war, it's always, let me put my good side forward. William Seward was actually born in Florida, Florida, New York, but not Florida. That was an interesting tidbit. Now then, if you have heard anything about this guy, William Seward, growing up in school, you would have heard about him because he was Secretary of State under Andrew Johnson also. And in 1867, he bought a little piece of property from Russia called Alaska. Seward's Folly, Seward's Icebox, same guy. Well, Lewis Thornton Powell, and here's my viewer discretion advice picture, number one. We're good. Lewis Lauren Powell hides in that cemetery until the next morning he goes back to the house of Mary Surratt, which is where the conspirators have been meeting. Unfortunately for him, that's the exact same time that federal troops are coming to arrest her for her part. They realize she's been a part of this, and so they are coming to arrest her. He shows up. It's early, early in the morning. He says, hey, I'm just here to dig some ditches for her. Uh, she says, I don't know who this person is. One of the people that's there to arrest her says, I know that guy, he tried to kill the Secretary of State. So he's captured, he's arrested, put on trial. Um, ensuing trial, he is found to be uh, stoic, dignified, and chivalrous, according to the documents, and actually more is published about young Lewis Lauren Powell than anybody else except for Mary Surratt, who was basically the first woman to be executed, uh, to be, be sentenced to this kind of death um, by the federal government. So lots written about her because she's the first, but then Lewis Thornton Powell, a lot is written about him too. Well, uh, July 7th, 1865. Now remember, April is when the assassination attempt happened. Mid-April, May, June, not even three months later, these guys have been found guilty in a military tribunal, even though they were civilians, which is one issue. But they've been found guilty, sentenced to death, and they are hanged in Washington. This is Lewis Thornton Powell. He's the tall guy. Uh, Mary Surratt over here in the dress beside him. And then the other two conspirators that have been captured, George Azerholt and uh, uh, David Harold. Those two guys got drunk and basically didn't do what they were supposed to do. So Lewis Thornton Powell tried to do what he was supposed to do, and John Wilkes Booth did what he had tried to do. He was killed later on as he was trying to escape. Well, as this is going on, George C. Powell, Lewis's dad, is still here in Live Oak, still, still preaching and teaching and performing marriages. He is trying to get up to Washington, D.C. so he could visit his son, but he's not able to get there in time. He gets sick, I believe, and it's just not able to make it. So he, he doesn't see his son, talk to his son, before he's executed. Well, the conspirators are thrown in graves there in Washington, D.C., and uh, his remains stayed there until 1871, where George Powell and the surviving brother come in and get the remains and take them to Florida. By this point, uh, George Powell has moved from Swanee County down to Osceola and Seminole County, and that's where they bury Lewis Thornton Powell's remains. Um, the last marriage I got from George Powell here was 1866, so I'm guessing probably after the war, all those northerners moving down found out that maybe he was the dad of Lewis Thornton Powell. So he wanted to go into places that were not as heavily populated. I don't know. I'm just guessing there. Anyway, that's where the remains are buried. And that might have been all, but in 1994, in the Smithsonian, somebody is doing an inventory of Indian artifacts, and they come across uh, item number 2244. It's a skull, and it says, quote, the cranium of Lewis Payne hung at Washington City for complicity in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. 1994 and so they realized somebody was a little morbid and took his head when they exhumed the, re the remains to send down the, the family so 1994 the head is brought back and buried with the rest of the body so interesting thing all right end of the war again april of 1865 general lee with the largest confederate army surrenders up in appomattox courthouse virginia but there are other armies that are still out there there's still the Confederate government. Now, Richmond is basically being captured at this point, and so the politicians, the, the, Fed, the Confederate politicians, the president and secretaries, are fleeing best they can. Uh, Jefferson Davis, General John C. Breckinridge, who was the last Secretary of War, that's him on the left, 
He actually had run for president of the United States in 1860. He was one of three or four beat out by Lincoln. But he was a southerner, he joined the Confederacy, he was a general, and later became the last Secretary of War. So he's fleeing, knowing that Union forces are out looking for him. Also, Judah Benjamin over here, which is the Secretary of State for the Confederacy. So they're fleeing, because at this point, they're wanting to capture, the Union is wanting to capture all these government officials and arrest them and keep them in prison. So they flee, start going southward. Um, a lot of them want to go through Florida to escape either to Mexico or the Bahamas or Cuba, somewhere where the United States could not get to them. And so they are fleeing and coming through Florida, and incidentally, they are coming through Suwannee County. Now, Jeff Davis is captured up in Urbanville, uh, Georgia. He doesn't make it as far south, but these two gentlemen, they do. Uh, let's see, May 14th, uh, Secretary of State Benjamin stays at the home of Lewis Mosley, who operates Mosley's Ferry, which was a few miles upriver from Charles Ferry. Uh, their friends, he stays there. Uh, how he got there, he had a map that had been drawn years before by a, an army uh, officer who was surveying, an engineer at the time, by the name of Robert E. Lee. So Robert E. Lee was here in the 1820s, 1830s, surveying property, surveying the rivers and whatnot. So uh, Secretary Benjamin used that to travel down to Swanee County. And then he fled. Uh, let's see. He eventually reached Great Britain. Had to see which one uh, met where. He went to Great Britain. A few days later, the other guy, the one on the left, General Breckinridge, last Secretary of War, comes down, stays at Charles Ferry, and crossed down. After visiting several folks like General Finnegan, who had been the victor at, at Olusty, friends with each other, um, he went to Cuba. So they fled in May of 1865. They came through Suwannee County on their trip to freedom. Also, on May 19, 1865, the last Confederate uh, ambulance and heavy wagon, which had like the last records of Confederacy, plus supposedly some gold and whatnot, traveled through uh, Swanee County, traveled through what's now O'Brien, part of that, that old St. Augustine Road, as they traveled southward. Just about a, a dozen officers and men were stationed to protect it, and they kept traveling, trying to get away, well, eventually, on the night of May 22nd, they're down in Archer. They find out that Jeff Davis has been captured. It's like, what's the point? So they basically disband and uh, go their own ways. The good thing is, John C. Breckinridge, the last Secretary of War, had preserved the records of the Confederacy. Now, Richmond and most of the buildings burned, but he had had the presence of mind, let's, let's keep this stuff just in case because it may be important for history's sake. So, because of him, we've got a lot of the records of the Confederacy that we otherwise would not have had. All right, again, for the umpteenth time, General Lee surrenders to General Grant April 9th, 1865. That's the end of the major fighting in the East, but not the end of fighting overall. Um, several other battles are happening. There's actually a battle in Columbus, Georgia on April 16th where uh, it's captured. The funny thing about that is a Confederate colonel is John Stith Pemberton, He's wondering that battle. And because of that, he's got pain the rest of his life. So he spends a lot of his life trying to figure out something that will help with the pain. And you would know him as the inventor of Coca-Cola, which originally had cocaine and stuff in it to help ease the pain. So uh, he fights in that, uh, is wounded in that battle. But other, other units surrender, like General Joseph E. Johnson, surrender on April 26th. Basically, half of our guys either went with Lee's men or with Johnson's men. So. Uh, April 26th, he surrenders. Alabama, Mississippi, East Louisiana surrender on May 4th. Uh, the Gulf District surrenders on May 5th. Jeff Davis is captured May 10th. Uh, the Department of Florida and South Georgia, which is part of us, surrenders on that same date. Um, other Army forces are surrendering at the end of May, like General Kirby Smith surrenders on May 26th. Uh, the last battle of the Civil War is fought at Palmetto Ranch in Texas, May 12th and May 13th. Not a big battle. But it is the last battle of the Civil War, a month after Lee surrendered. Uh, the last army, to, or big army, to surrender is uh, Cherokee Brigadier General Stan Waddy's group of Indian soldiers. They surrendered on June 23rd, so May, June. So two months after Lee surrenders, and most of the fighting is over, he surrenders. The last Confederate surrender does not happen until November of 1865, and that is a a ship by the name of Shenandoah. 
a uh, merchant raider, like the, you know, the CSS Alabama, a lot of people have heard of. Well, the CSS Shenandoah was another one of those raiders. And he basically attacked the Pacific and attacked the welling fleets of, of Union forces. And so they were just out of contact and had no idea. And the first time they heard that maybe the, the South had lost, they didn't believe it. But eventually they were persuaded, yep, it, it's real. Went to England and surrendered there, hoping he'd get a better a better deal. So the war was declared over officially only on August 20 of 1866. So the Civil War ends. The war's effect on Florida, again, we were a backwards area, the least heavily populated of the Confederacy. Other than some of those coastal towns like Jacksonville, Tampa, whatnot, there was not a lot of material damage to Suwannee County or, or to Florida or Suwannee County. Um, <clears throat> We lost men, we lost the use of slaves, that was about half a million dollars in Swanee County uh, that was lost. But materially speaking, we didn't really lose uh, much, which was good. Of our casualties, of our men, about 15% of the white adult male population in Swanee County served, about 250 men. That's apparently a pretty good number, according to statistics I've seen. Uh, most of them served starting in April 1861, then re-enlisted in uh, May of 1862 for the duration of the war. I had originally, years ago, started trying to make a list of every soldier from Swanee County that served, and it just had to be too long. I just couldn't do it. But I did start making a note of several notable Swanee Countyans, and so I'm gonna give you a list. Some of these we've already talked about. Some of these we will be talking about. People like George McClellan, who we talked about, early settler, militia unit uh, leader, judge, state representative. Craven Lassiter, who was our first postmaster at Houston, and he was later a state legislator from Leon County. David Lang, I've already mentioned. Silas Overstreet, who was a doctor and later became our state representative. Uh, his house still exists across from the Dowling House, by the way. Uh, still there. Zacchaeus Shepherd, who was a doctor and the county coroner at one point early on. Uh, John H. Baker, who was Swanee County Sheriff at one point. Noble Hole, who was our first sheriff. Uh, later, he was a state representative. And then briefly, he was Lieutenant Governor of Florida. Uh, William Bynum was a doctor. He was also a longtime clerk of the Florida House of Representatives for like decades. Also Robert Ivey, who built steamboats. Branford's named, he's the one that named Branford or whatnot. Uh, a lot of other politicians, business leaders. My own four great grandfather, who was Millage G. Clayton, served with those guys. So uh, he moved here. We're not sure after the war or during the war, but he served with those guys. He was in that same unit, so that indicates he was here at one point. Although in 1870, he was sheriff in South Georgia. Um, anyway. Lots of history, lots of people. Now, depending on where they signed out up, which unit they signed up with, most of our boys either went to the Army of Northern Virginia under Lee or with General Johnson uh, out in, in Mississippi and whatnot, that area. Uh, so they either fought in places like Chancellorsburg, uh, Antietam, Gettysburg, or they fought at places like uh, uh, Chattanooga, Chickamauga, Atlanta, things like that. So depending on which unit they, they went with, lots of people. Um, Again, Pickett's charge, 64% of them were dead or wounded just in that attack, that battle, during Gettysburg. And actually, if you look at all the soldiers in Florida, nearly half were either killed or injured. Now, some of those injuries were minor and they were fully recovered, but half of them, basically, that were from Florida died or were injured. So, that ends our discussion of the Civil War. Next month, Lord willing, we'll talk about the relocation of the county seat from Houston to Live Oak.